Welcome everyone, my name is Rosemary, and today this presentation will be discussing being a home health aide and the roles and responsibilities that come with the title of a home health aide. Before we dive into the material, let's first discuss some objectives. Upon completion of this program, you should be able to define what a home health aide is, describe the duties of a home health aide, describe how the HHA is evaluated of their performance, read and understand a plan of care or an aid care plan, document according to the aid care plan, and understand agency documentation and other policy and procedural requirements. Some basic definitions before we get into the content. Um, ACP refers to an aid care plan, which is an individualized written document that identifies the home health aide specific assignments and duties related to each the clinician plan. in regard to these presentations and some of these softwares that we're using to the nursing supervisor, the registered nurse, the LPN, or even the home health, whatever clinician is providing a service in the client's home. Intradiscipline is within the scope of one discipline, whereas interdisciplinary is related to more than one branch of knowledge. Finally, the plan of care. A plan of care is an individualized written document that identifies patient-specific measurable outcomes and goals and which is established, periodically reviewed, and signed by a doctor of medicine, osteop, or podiatrist acting within the scope of her state licensation or registration. Now, what is a home health aide? I guess the better question to ask would be, who is a home health aide? Now, a home health aide is typically someone who works in a home care setting to provide personal care services. However, according to the condition of participation, all home health aid services must be provided by individuals who meet the personal requirements specified in paragraph A of this section. Paragraph A discusses the home health aid qualification. A qualified home health aide is a person who has successfully completed either one, two, three, or four of these. Be in a training or competency evaluation program as described in paragraph B and C, and the requirements of state licensure program that meets the provisions of paragraph B and C of this section. A home health aide or nurse's aide is not considered to have completed a program as specified in paragraph A1 of this section. If since the individual's most recent completion of the program, there has been a continuous period of 24 consecutive months during which none of the services furnished by the individuals as described in section 409.40 of this chapter were for compensation. If there has been a 24-month lapse in furnishing services for compensation, the individual must complete another program as specified in paragraph A1 of this section. Now, how do you qualify as a home health aide? The conditions of participation also have their own qualifying factors. Section B discusses the content and duration of home health aide classroom and supervised training. In total, there must be at least a minimum of 75 hours training, 16 of those hours which must, which must be supervised clinical practical training, and 60 hours of which are classroom training. A home health aide training program must address each of the following subject areas such as communication skills, observation, reporting, and documentation of patient status and the care or service furnished, reading and recording temperatures. However, part three, reading and recording temperatures, pulse and respiration, that will differ by agency. So make sure you ask your agency representative whether you guys will be reading, recording temperature, pulse, and respiration. Um, going forward, basic inspection, prevention control procedures, basic elements of body functioning, maintenance of clean, safe, healthy environment, uh, recognize any emergencies and the knowledge of instituting emergency procedures and their application, and the physical, emotional, and developmental needs of and ways to work with the population served by the home health agency, the need for respect for the patient and his or her privacy and his or her property. The home health agency must maintain documentation that demonstrates that the requirements of this standard have been met. The HSA training program curriculum is set out in our standards to be as follows. A home health aide training program must address all of the subject areas discussed in the previous slide as well as these continuing right here. Appropriate and safe techniques and performing personal hygiene and grooming tasks that include bed baths, sponge baths, shower, um, hair shampooing in sink or tub or in the bed, nail and skin care, oral hygiene, toileting and elimination. Other things such as safe transfer techniques, ambulation, normal range of motion and positioning, adequate nutrition and fluid intake, recognizing and reporting changes in skin condition, and any other tasks that the HHA may choose to have an aid perform as permitted under the state law. The Home Health Agency is responsible for training home health aides as needed for skills not covered in basic checklists as described in paragraph B. What does a home health aide do? In the very basic essence, whether in a nursing home, in a hospital, or in a home care setting where the client is within their own home, a home health aide assists with activities of daily living, such as toileting, bathing, transferring, grooming, dressing, and making even eating and feeding. 
standard sheet of the conditions of participation discusses the home health aid assignments and duties. Home health aides are assigned to specific patients, to a specific patient by a registered nurse or other appropriate skilled professional with written patient care instructions for home health aid prepared by that registered nurse or other appropriate skilled professional. That is, a physical therapist, speech language pathologist, or occupational therapist. A home health aide provides services that are ordered by the physician, included in the plan of care, permitted to be performed under state law, and consists with the home health aide training. The duties of a home health aide include the provision of hands-on personal care. That is our first priority. The performance of simple procedures as an extension of therapy and nursing services, assistance in ambulation or exercises, and assistance in administering medications ordinarily self-administered. A home health aide will not necessarily administer the medication. However, um, depending on your agency policies, the home health aide can definitely cue the client and remind them to take those medications are originally self-administered. Home health aides must be members of the interdisciplinary team and must report changes in a patient's condition to a registered nurse or other appropriate skilled professional and must complete appropriate records in compliance with the home health agency's policies and procedures. Now let's talk about performance, whether it's onboarding and the pre-hire status, whether it's annual performance evaluation. Standard H discusses the supervision of home health aides, and it reads, if the home health aid services are provided to a patient who is receiving skilled nursing, um, in this case, skilled nursing services, a registered nurse who is familiar with the patient, the patient's plan of care, the written patient care instructions described in 44.80 section G, must make an on-site visit to the patient's home no less frequently than every 14 days, that is every two weeks. The home health aide does not have to be present during this visit. If an area of concern in aid services is noted by the supervising registered nurse or another skilled professional, then the supervising individual must make an on-site visit to the location where the patient is receiving care in order to observe and assess the aid while he or she is performing care. Thirdly, a registered nurse must make an annual on-site visit to the location where the patient is receiving care in order to assess each aid while he or she is performing care. This is completed annually upon each aid's annual evaluation. Part two of that reads, if a home health aid, ser if home health aid services are provided to a patient who is not receiving skilled nursing care, the registered nurse must make an on-site visit to the location where the patient is receiving care no less frequently than every 60 days in order to observe and assess each aid while he or she is performing care. Now let's discuss documentation, evaluation, doing your notes. Standard G continues to discuss the supervision of home health aids. If a deficiency in aid services is verified by the registered nurse during an on-site visit, the agency must conduct and the home health aid must complete a competency evaluation program in accordance with paragraph C of this step. Home health aid supervision must ensure that aid furnished in a safe and effective manner, including but not limited to the following elements. Following the patient's plan of care for completion of tasks assigned to the HHA aid by the registered nurse, maintain an open communication process with the patient and representative, demonstrate a competency with assigned tasks, complying with infection prevention and control policies and procedures, reporting changes in the patient's condition, and honoring patient's rights. Now let's talk about these records. Documentation occurs and records must be filed. The Protected Health Information Act discusses how individually identifiable health information must be protected, such as names, phone numbers, fax numbers, social security numbers, medical record numbers, account numbers, health plan numbers, and so on and so forth. That is the same thing you want to replicate within our own agency. Make sure you are protecting the client's information and all records are stored properly. Your agency may have a record policy such as this in which it reads clinical rec containing past and current information are maintained for every patient accepted by our agency and receiving these services. Records are utilized as a tool for coordination of services and as legal document that is descriptive of care and services provided as a resource document for billing and reimbursement. Our agency has a process for managing patient records to create, maintain, and safeguard measures involved in the medical record system. If you guys have access to these presentations, you will be able to click on um, the links attached and view certain policies such as these. Your agency may have a completely different policy. However, this is a sample policy that we can discuss. Um, make sure you ask your agency representative for their own agency-specific policies regarding these um, conditions of participation and these regulatory requirements. In all, the records policy should state something where medical records shall be stored in locked metal cabinets. No medical record or patient clinical file shall be removed from the premises where the patient is served from except 
for off-site documentation storage. So documents should be stored either in the client's home or in the agency's main office or wherever their records department is. You may also have a documentation submission requirement policy may be as specific as this. In essence, all documentation should be submitted within 24 to 48 hours, okay? There is a five-day window for OASIS documents. However, as a home health aide, that is pretty much relevant to you. All paper documents are due to the office every week and all virtual electronically signed documents should be submitted every 24 to 48 hours after the completion of a visit. This is our change in condition, significant condition policy. Again, if you have access to the presentation, you will be able to click on the link, but the policy does this. It is the policy of our agency to follow established procedures for reporting and documentation of significant changes in the patient's condition. The definition of significant change in this policy is a decline or improvement in a resident's status that will not normally resolve itself without further intervention by staff or by implemented standards related clinical interventions is not self-limited. It impacts more than one area of the patient's health status and requires interdisciplinary review and or revision of the plan of care. Again, if you have access to these presentations, you will be able to click on the link and view that sample policy in its entirety. Now let's discuss infection control. Infection control policies will be geared towards preventing the spread of infection. Taking a look at this top-down effect, from the most effective elimination, physically remove the hazard, substitution replaces the hazard, engineering isolates people from the hazard, administrative changes the way people work, and PPE is to protect the worker with personnel protective equipment. You will find that all these are used at different levels, but at the home health aid level, you will basically just maintain the, the bottom three personal protective equipment, administrative, and engineering, okay? So, infection control in the work environment. There is a policy similar to this. Our agency is committed to providing a safe and healthful environment for our employees and patients through education, current application of infection control practices, and implementation of appropriate safety measures. In pursuit of this endeavor, our exposure control plan is provided to eliminate and minimize exposure control to bloodborne pathogens in accordance with OSHA standard 29 CFR 1910.1. 1030, Occupational Exposure to Bloodborne Pathogens. The procedure reads as follows. The ECP is a key document to assist our firm in implementing and ensuring compliance with the standard, thereby protecting our employees. The ECP includes determination of employee exposure, implementation of various methods of control, including universal precautions, communication of hazards to employees and trainings, record keeping, procedures for evaluating circumstances surrounding an exposure incident, and methods of implementation of these elements of the standard are discussed in subsequent pages of the ECP. Each agency's ECP will differ, but again, like I said below, you can click on the links to view the infection control policy and the infection monitoring policy. When it comes to the infection control policy, it is pertinent that you understand universal and infection control education is provided to employees at orientation annually and as situations arise that the best practice would encourage further knowledge and education. Employees are required to report any evidence of respiratory a dermatologic, which is skin, or other potentially communicable symptoms to the nursing supervisor prior to visiting a patient. Reported employees' infections are logged, tracked, and reported to the QAIC committee on a quarterly basis. Trends are identified and recommendations and action plans are formulated and implemented within the organization to improve the quality of the work environment. Employees with reported flu symptoms are not allowed to visit patients until symptoms are gone. Employees with flu-like symptoms are plotted onto the agency's pandemic software grid. So at the very basic, as a home health aide, it is your duty to report any signs of infection that you may have. Now when it comes to infection monitoring, this is something that the agency has to do. Agency shall monitor the on for the onset of nasofusal patient infection and or evidence of pandemic flu outbreak. Employee infections shall be monitored for quality assurance and performance improvement activity. Now let's talk about incidents. Reporting incidents and feared incidents, um, what do you do? The pharmacy voice headline of patient safety incident reporting. Reporting all errors and near misses and involve the whole team. Learn, identify and investigate causes of errors and use them as learning opportunities. Sharing, discuss with others and promote learning. Act, make changes to the practice and review, review these changes to the practice. 
the idea is about being open and being honest with each other. So please make sure if you see an incident, say it, report it, okay? Essence of what we need to remember is when you're making a report, you need to discuss who, what, when, where, and possibly even why, okay? So now let's just look at a, a sample incident reported policy. Policy C3 31 discusses incident reporting. It is a policy of our agency to provide accurate and timely documentation of unusual occurrences and accidents and incidents in order to episode fact finding of our agency which are disruptive a review and evaluate c determine which incidents require b examine the conditions which jeopardize the safety of patients and employees d correct isolated adverse events complete and root cause analysis for the event e identify trends and patterns f continuously improve quality of care and g hazardous materials management now, do you guys have any questions? If you have any questions, please make sure you have written them down. That way you can ask your agency representative. However, before we close off this presentation, I will also include some frequently asked questions in which um, you guys should be able to answer by the end of this presentation. What does HHA stand for? Home health. What does an HHA do? Provide personal care services as described and ordered in the plan of care. Who supervises the HHA? The RN, registered nurse, or other skilled professional. How often is HHA supervised? At least every 14 days in joint visits upon annual evaluation. What should be reported about the client? Significant changes to medical conditions such as the skin. Six, who does the home health aide make official reports to? And supervise an RN or and the office manager at the age. Seven, what types of infections? Um, is the HHA supposed to report. Employees are required to report any evidence of respiratory, dermatologic, or other potentially communicable symptoms to their nurse and supervisor prior to visiting a patient. Eight, when are visit notes and documentation due to submission? Every 24 to 48 hours after the visit has been completed. Are home health aides required to file incident reports? If so, in what case? Home health aides are not necessarily required to file incident reports, however, they are supposed to report it to their agency. That way, the administration can figure out the proper protocol and procedure for filing incident reports. That is it, everyone. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, again, make sure you write down these questions so you can ask your agency representative. The resources in which we're used to create this presentation are CMS Conditions of Participation from January 13, 2018, as well as Cornell Law School, and that just listed the conditions of participation in an easier to read format, okay? So if you guys have any questions, please make sure you comment down below. If you guys enjoyed this video, if you guys are working home health aides and you found this helpful, let me know. If you still have more questions, please feel free to list the questions down in the comments below. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you guys learned so much. Until next time, I will see you then.